I would like to invite you to open your Bibles with me, please. And we're going to do a bit of a hop, skip, and a jump today as we begin our Christmas series. We're going to call this a journey to the manger. Journey to the manger. And we're going to have a part of the mystery each Sunday leading up to Christmas. And today we're going to call this the mystery prepared. The mystery prepared. We're looking at Genesis chapter 3, then into Exodus, then to Luke. We won't be long at uh, any one particular place. But we want to look at the story, the event, the preparation for what we're getting ready to celebrate. I said the name Isaac Newton. Does that mean anything to anybody? Now, if I say Newton, okay, a little, little biscuit, Fig Newtons. Do you, do we call those Fig Newtons here. I always call them Fig Newtons. Fig Rolls. Oh, Fig Rolls. We always call them Fig Newtons in the States. I don't know why, but... Yeah. Anyway, Fig Newton. It doesn't make any sense to me. But if I said the name Isaac Newton, does that mean anything to anybody? Okay. What's famous about Isaac Newton? What particular event? No, not the light bulb. Not the light bulb. No. Isaac Newton was before this. Isaac Newton was the, the very famous one who kind of sort of discovered gravity. Gravity. And the story goes that Isaac Newton was at his home or possibly at, his, at the university where he was, somewhere, and that he observed that an apple fell from the tree. That seems a bit daft, right? That's what apples do if they get heavy or whatever, and they, you know, the, the little branch can't hold them anymore, it just falls down from the tree. But as he was sitting there thinking about it, he asked himself a question. And there's, this is kind of starts a, a series of things. And, uh, you know, you and me, we would never think, why should we spend or waste time looking at an apple tree and watching the apple fall down off the tree? I could be doing, oh, I could be watching Corey or something like that, yeah? I could, I could be playing football or driving one of Lee's cars, or I don't know, fi fixing something in Doreen's house. Why should I even watch, a, watch a, an apple tree? And it went from Isaac Newton, he must have had, had this pathway uh, where he never even considered the idea, but then he asked himself the question, well, why does the apple fall down and it doesn't? What path? Oh. Go up? Mm -hmm. That's a reasonable question, ain't it? Now, just because we've always seen the apple fall down, mm -hmm. he was sort of aware enough to start thinking, why is it that the apple does fall down and not float up? Then, around the 1600s, so we're talking 400 years ago, he started asking himself, himself the question of, well, it goes down and not up. And then the question comes in as to why? Why, why does it happen? It is around this time that was called the Age of Enlightenment, the age where scientific stuff started to happen. And then he spent countless hours and time and expense trying to define how it works and put numbers to it and all that kind of stuff. And thankfully, now because of all that hard work, now we can do things like put satellites in this, into orbit. All that is much of it is based on Mr. Isaac Newton, what he started thinking about this. What was a mystery all of a sudden became more understood. Now, will I be able to understand how gravity works? No, I mean, we know that it works. I mean, if I got my keys here in my pocket and I drop them off the floor, it works. And there's you could, you could put mathematical equations and stuff and all kinds of things to describe that, but if you had to tell me why does it work, I don't know. I don't know. 
And so the mystery that we're going to be looking at beginning today of this thing of God himself coming to earth, being born in a manger, born a virgin, and everything that Jesus did. I wish I could be able to tell you how it all works, but I can't. I can't. I wish I could. And maybe one day in heaven, we'll know more about it. But here's the thing. For everyone here that is a believer and who may be watching on YouTube, I want us this Christmas time to be in awe, to be, to appreciate the mystery, to appreciate the amazingness, the awesomeness of what God did, of what Jesus did, of everything for every event that we're getting ready to look at, not just today, for these next few weeks as well. So first of all, I want us to just think about the Christmas mystery hint. Hint. Looking in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. Let's read the, what the Bible says. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, all of creation has happened. God had said to Adam and Eve, you're not meant to eat from this, uh, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you do, you will die. This was God's promise. Sadly, the old serpent came along, as we know. And Satan had uh, embodied the serpent. Satan had, Satan had come into the serpent. And, the serpent. and uh, now all of a sudden, and we see some of the results of all of all this. God came. To, God comes down. Uh, Adam said, uh, "Oh, uh, the woman that you gave me. She's the one who gave me the fruit. So here we go. The, the blame game straight away." But then, verse fourteen, the Lord said to the serpent, "He said, because you have done this." You are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field on your belly. You shall go and you uh, shall eat dust in all the, day, all the days of your life. And I will put enmity, interesting word. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, first of all, first of all, this is a puzzle. This is a puzzle. If we only had the book of Genesis in our Bible, we'd be scratching our heads forever on what God was on about here. Because there are some things there that if we only had that, I wouldn't be able to understand. But when we see some of the later parts of the Bible, then it's like a jigsaw. We're going to start to put them together and to see what God was meaning, and the words that God had said, how they apply. So what's interesting, he puts this curse on the serpent. He puts this curse on the serpent. Now, I want to ask you a question. Let's just, now, the reality is that Satan is real. Do you believe that, by the way? The demons are real. Yeah. The forces of evil are real. <laughs> They want to oppose everything that God is doing that is true and that is real. Here it is, this serpent. Now, if we can understand and put the pieces together and read between the lines, that this particular serpent would have had legs. So if we can say that that is the snakes as we know today, then pre-fall, pre-sin, snakes would have had legs. Possibly like a little centipede. That would make, make them scarier yet. Can you imagine a snake with a hundred legs? <laughs> going twice as fast? Ooh. I don't want to think about that. I don't like snakes, by the way. Because of that. But here's the thing. Did the snake do anything wrong? Did the snake do anything wrong? Dory? Now, Dory loves animals. Do you like snakes? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not going to get any... <laughs> The snake didn't do anything wrong. But God cursed the snake. Is it fair? Is it fair? No. Ah. Life isn't fair. Life isn't fair. Satan inhabited this particular animal. Demons seem to like a host. If you look throughout the Bible, uh, you'll often find this the situation. And uh, they're, during closure years, 
You remember the account in, uh, in, in the Gospels where there was this man possessed by this legion of demons? He, the demons were cast out. And they said, tell us where we can go. And then said there was this group of, what were the animals? Pigs. pigs. Mm -hmm. These demons went, inhabited these pigs, and went nutso, ran off this cliff, and sadly perished. There's another, there's another account in Matthew chapter 12 that there is this demon. Uh, Jesus was speaking of a demon inhabiting a particular person. And uh, Jesus explains that if this demon leaves and, uh, and, and, uh, and then uh, because if, if this man does not get his life right uh, with God and receives a relationship with God through what Jesus is going to do. Uh, and he says, well, I'm all about religion. Jesus then say, uh, the a worst thing could happen because seven demons could return and inhabit this particular person. Now, so the point is that it seems that uh, demons, Satan likes to inhabit individuals, whether it be people or pigs. The reality of the situation is, is this thing going dead already? Oh, for heaven's sake. Change the battery this. So the reality of the situation is that that the demons like to inhabit uh, people, things, and so it seems that Satan inhabited this particular serpent, and the reality is, any times there is sin, there is wrong, there's going to be collateral damage. Okay? The situation. There's going to be a collateral damage, just like if I was to get in my car and, and I was to go out driving irresponsibly, uh, and I have an accent. You could say, Eric, that's your, that's your fault. Okay, you had that accent. You're driving irresponsibly. That's true. But if I was to hit another car, I was to hurt people, or people would even die. Were they doing anything wrong? No. Yeah. They just happened to be in my path. And so when wrong happens, there's always, there many times, there's collateral damage. <clears throat> there's other things and other things <clears throat> that get hurt. So here it is, this, this, this curse on this serpent that um, because of this situation, that God curses the serpent. The serpent then has to crawl on its belly, as we see there uh, throughout all of its days. Now, I think we can actually say that because of that, that all of these, uh, what we see now, uh, snakes would be on their belly. Interestingly, interestingly, though, that if we think about a lot of medical symbols, uh, have you ever seen the British... Uh, um, uh, the logo for the British Medical Association. It's interesting. It's basically a stick, a pole. You know what's on that pole? Snake. A serpent. And the snake. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what that actually goes to a biblical event, where this was the, the account of, Mo, of, of, of Moses, and uh, snakes were biting people, and uh, God instructed Moses to take a, 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 a pole and get a bronze serpent, put it upon that pole with people to look to the pole, they would live. They would live. So now, British Medical Association, the American Medical Association, others probably around the world, use that as a symbol of health. Isn't that interesting? But there's a serpent, there's a curse on the serpent. But then what's even more interesting is that there's a prophecy towards Satan. Notice what he says. He says, I will put enmity. I will, the word enmity means hatred. I will put hatred between you, who's the you here? The people. No, no, no. I'll put enmity, enmity between you, Satan, and the woman. So here's Satan in, embodied in that, in that serpent, and there's the woman. I will put hatred between you and okay. the woman, between your seed and her seed. Now, what seed means what? Seed means followers. Seed means uh, generations to come. Mm -hmm. That's sort of a broad kind of category, okay? So God is saying, I will put hatred between you, Satan, and all of your followers, mm -hmm. all of the demons, between you and the woman and all of human, oh, humanity, basically. So there's going to be this, this, this hatred, this, 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 this battle between Satan and all of humanity, but not just all of humanity in general, and specifically with who? Eventually, Jesus, who yeah. is to come. Now, we're going to see that here in just a second. 
He says, he gives it more specific. He said, he, he meaning humanity, but the particular one that we see just a hint of here, he will bruise your Satan. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. heel. Well, that's interesting. Why would he choose such weird parts of the body? Now, if you bang your heel, does it hurt? No. Yep. Yeah, if you've ever, <laughs> yeah. you ever had a heel yeah. spur, or you, oh, there we go. If you ever had any little children in your house, and they leave out Lego <laughs> in your house, ain't nothing hurts worse than yeah. stepping on a Lego. They're evil. I love them. But they're evil little pieces. And they hide all over the place. And I think they scamper around and just get in your path. Well, that hurts, but it won't put you away. Yeah. However, if you've gotten knocked in the head, is the chance for a lethal blow much more for a knock to the head mm -hmm. and stepping on the Lego? Mm -hmm. Better believe. That's the message here. That's the message. And this is a hint. It's just a hint. Mm -hmm. That the one that's going to come from humanity, that he will bruise or destroy you, Satan, and you are going to do everything you can to destroy him, but it's just going to be like stepping on a Lego. It's going to hurt. The cross wasn't, pla wasn't pleasant. Everything that Jesus experienced, the temptations in the wilderness, weren't pleasant. But it wasn't a death blow. But Jesus did dealt a death blow to Satan. And I know right now Satan is still active in the world. The demons are still active in the world. But I tell you what, he's got limited time. And praise God for that. God's got a plan for Satan. He's going to put him away forever. Forever. We won't, at one point, have to deal with him ever again. So praise God for that. And I want you to quickly turn with me to Romans chapter 16. And I want you to see like a little a New Testament reference to this. Romans chapter 16. And I want you to just see this is not something sort of airy-fairy. This has some meat to it, has some reality to it. Romans 16, it's just a brief little possible reference possible reference to what Moses is speaking of here in Genesis chapter 3 Romans 16 20 if you're there let me just read it to you the Bible says this and the God of peace will crush who Satan under your feet shortly and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. Now, you could argue, Eric, well, he doesn't talk about all the other details, but it's interesting the words that he uses. Very, very similar. So Paul, the writer of Romans, may have gotten those words from Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, the words we just got done reading. So there's the Christmas mystery hint. Something embedded in those first three chapters in verses 14 and 15 about something that's going to happen many, many years down the road. Now, we move on now. We're going to look at the Christmas mystery hidden in Exodus chapter 12. If you want to follow, if you want to go with, go with us there. We're going to travel on in time. Exodus chapter 12. We're going to go past many generations. We're going to come and visit with Mr. Moses here for just a few minutes. Look at this Christmas mystery hidden in Exodus chapter 12, verse 11 through 14. The uh, children of Israel have been crying out in, and because they were in bondage. They've become slaves. God had gotten hold of Moses said, Moses, I want you to go back to Israel. I want you to go back to Egypt and to free my people. Nine of the ten judgments have already happened. You come to this last 
judgment from God onto Egypt. <laughs> it says this in verse 11. It says, Thus ye shall eat it, talking about the Passover, the Passover. Mm -hmm. Thus ye shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and so shall you, shall you eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night. And that's where we get the word Passover from. Mm -hmm. And I shall strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will so pass so over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. The time, thousands of years later now, from Genesis chapter 3 to Exodus chapter 12, we've got thousands of years we don't know exactly how long, but God's plan was beginning to unfold. Look, we have the patience to wait thousands of years. We don't have patience to wait to level crossing. <laughs> Man, that thing comes down, and here I am, flying. Train should be here by now. And, ugh, hey, we're not good with waiting, are we? But God, well, with God, listen, a day is as a what? A thousand years. Isn't that what the Bible says? And a thousand years is as a day. So for God, uh, three minutes of level crossing is like four or five hundred years. No big deal. For us, it's a big deal. But for God, it says, hey, I've got a plan. It's okay. Hang tight. Everything's going to be good. I've got your back. God's plan is, the beginning, is beginning to unfold. And another hint is revealed to us in this thing of the Passover. So here is the setup. The tenth judgment against Egypt. Now remember, this was before any of the law was established. This thing of taking an animal, killing an animal, taking the blood putting it on the doorpost and on the lintel, the bit above. They would have been familiar with the idea of a sacrifice. But we need to remember, in, pagan, in times like that, a sacrifice was to do what? Was to appease the anger of the gods. In general, around the world, this is, this is the idea of a sacrifice, to appease the <coughs> anger of the gods. But Moses' sacrifice was not for that. It was as a foreshadow, foreshadow, a picture of what Jesus would eventually do on the cross. Eric, where do you get that from? I'll show you. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. What a great little nugget. Great little nugget this is. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. As Paul was talking about the church and the things that harm the church, Paul says this, Therefore purge out the old leaven, leaven means yeast, in the Bible, it means anything. Yeast is always pictured as a uh, as, as sin. That's been always a symbol for sin. Yeast, leaven, that sort of thing. Paul says, that, therefore, purge out the old leaven because in order to prepare for Passover, there was a what you had to do is you had to go through all your house. You had to clean it all out. Make sure there was no leaven. So if you had any uh, little bits of yeast that in, in your kitchen cupboard, you had to get rid of it. Because that was a symbol for sin. And Paul is saying, and likewise, therefore purge out all the old leaven that you may be a new lump, speaking about the bread, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, and that's what's the next words, our Passover, 
was sacrificed for us. And that little nugget of truth, Paul takes that, what, that event of what happened there in those days in, uh, with, with Moses, uh, that, that, that tenth judgment of the Passover, God establishing that Passover lamb, and he connects it to the cross. He's saying what was pictured all those many, many years ago eventually was fulfilled as Jesus died on the cross. And that's why today we don't have to do Passover. We don't have to kill a lamb, thankfully. We don't have to do all that stuff because Jesus, our Passover, was sacrificed for, for us. And that is Christmas hidden. Now, the Jews didn't understand that. All they saw was the Passover. It was meant to teach them of what, of what was to come. Now, just because it was hidden does not mean that it was totally unknown, un unknowable. But the problem becomes when something, and I don't like the word religious, but I'll use the word religious. When a religious activity becomes the main focus. When the religious activity takes center stage, but the meaning behind the religious activity gets pushed away. That's why when we do this candle, we have to be careful. It's not all about the candle. It's about reminding ourselves that Jesus is the light of the world. When we have, Lord, when we have communion, it's not all about the bread and the juice. It's the meaning behind the bread and the juice. When we baptize, it's not all about the baptism. It's not all about the water. It's about the meaning behind the baptism. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. We have to, be, we have to be, be very careful. We have to guard against turning the, the, the church crank, turning the religious crank, and doing stuff just because we do stuff and forget. Because that's exactly what happened with the Jewish nation. God gave him that beautiful thing of Passover. And he said, it's meant to be a memorial for you to remember God's deliverance out of Egypt. But there was a more, there was a deeper, more spiritual meaning. It wasn't just a physical deliverance, but it was also a foreshadow. It was a, it was a picture of their deliverance from sin eventually. Jesus on the cross. But sadly, those who Jesus came for first are the very ones that called out, crucify him, yeah. crucify him. They forgot. Let's not forget. Let's not forget. Last but not least, we want to come to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Now, from the time of Moses to Luke chapter 1, hundreds and hundreds of years. And we see Christmas, the mystery revealed. Now, here's the thing. We talked about that there was you know, thousands of years from the time of Genesis 3 to Exodus 12. And then from Exodus 12 all the way up through all the events, hundreds and hundreds of years. But then from the time of the very last book, very last prophecy of the Old Testament. By the way, what's the last book of the Old Testament? Anyone know? What's that, Don? Anybody know? Start with an M. Malachi, very good. Malachi. Someone said Malachi. Hey, that's, uh, that's okay too. Okay. Malachi, very last book. And then the, the, the issue was everything went silent. Nothing from God. For four to five hundred years. Four to five hundred years. That's the time from Mr. Isaac Newton up to today. That's a long time. 
Now, I can say the words four or five hundred years, but my goodness, I, I reckon, let's see, I have to add up numbers here. If we had all of our birthdays all toted up, how much would it be? <laughs> oh, Chris, is 167. So. <laughs> no, you know, you know what I mean. I mean, we may add up to five, I don't know, could we add up to four or five hundred years? We, we may, we may get close. I don't know. We may, uh, yeah, probably so. But that's all of us added up together. But here it is, all oh, this, 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 this nation of people having all these promises and everything stops. No message from the Lord. No prophets coming up and saying, uh, warnings to Israel, uh, uh, Messiah is coming, nothing. Here's the interesting thing. Uh, one of the tools for speakers uh, and I learned this in the seminary, so it must be true. One of the tools of speakers is to stop. Because it's interesting. I've experimented, and I do it sometimes. And when you stop, all of a sudden, people, what? What? What's happening? They're listening. Yeah. They start listening again. And then when an orchestra plays, and da, 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 all of a sudden it stops. Everyone gets their, their attention is back. All of a sudden, it builds up again. And I'm wondering if this is what God was doing. He, after, after all these hundreds and thousands of years of preparing and, and plowing and getting the, the soil all ready, then there was this stop. All of a sudden, the real deal started to happen. Luke chapter 1. Verse 31. Now I realize our friend Zechariah and what was his wife called? Remember? Zechariah and John the Baptist, mom and dad. That means her name starts with an E. Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Zechariah and Elizabeth. Yes, the angel visited them, visited him, and said that you're gonna have a, he's going to have a son. But that wasn't the main event. So here it was. Mary, out doing her thing, having knowing nothing and nobody, gets this message. Luke chapter 1. Let's start in verse 30. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid. It'd be a really good little study to see the number of times the Bible says, don't fear, don't be afraid, just like our dear friend Peter, on the water, Jesus said, don't be afraid. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And, his, and, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now there's other stuff, we'll get to that later. But what I also want us to do, all I want us to realize is that God's plan now is starting to unfold. It's still a mystery. The number of times, and we've looked at this before when we went through some of the Gospels, that the number of times when Jesus said, I will be crucified and will, and will rise again three days later, and our dear friend Peter said, no you won't. How dare you think like that? You're our friend. You're our master. Peter said, or Jesus said, Peter, you'll get it like Wednesdays. You'll get it. So God's plan is starting to unfold. The mystery is still there, though. I'm trying to understand how all this is happening. But after four to five hundred years now, angel, the angel comes to visit Mary. What was special about Mary? <laughs> and here's the good news to us as well. God can take a little to, of nothing mm -hmm. and make it become much. Mm -hmm. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. You know what? I ain't nothing, really. I'm a creation of God. But God can take a little of nothing 
do something with it, if we just are willing to be that lump of clay that God's willing to take and shape and mold. And he took a little nothing town, a little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Among the deep. Da, 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 da. What is it? Is Bethlehem? Is it, is it London? No. Bethlehem was a little nothing village. I mean a nothing. Nothing good comes out of that. But God can take it and do something amazing. And he did. She was from an insignificant family. No one knows who Mary's parents were. There's, there's tradition. But no one knows. Her dad was not the CEO of DHL. Huh? Her mom was not the Queen of England. Her family was nothing. They were just a village. They were, they were, they were, they were a family from the village. That's it. And Mary was an insignificant teenager. From a nothing village, from a nothing family, produces a nothing teenager. In our eyes, or from God's eyes, different story. Different story. So, can I remind each one of you? you know, sometimes you may feel like a nothing. Right? Been there. In fact, I got a whole bunch of t-shirts. Sometimes we can feel like a nothing. Or maybe the world will tell us we're a nothing. Or maybe Facebook will tell us we're a nothing. Some of your social media, right? It's good at doing that. But don't you remember, in God's eyes, you ain't a nothing. That's good English. You ain't a nothing. Because here's the miracle, that God himself would take on human flesh and come in the likeness of man to deliver God's message of salvation to everyone who would hear. I know what a great message that is. So as we begin our journey to the manger, this was a mystery prepared, and we can connected the dots just a little bit throughout history. This wasn't a surprise thing. God was not thinking on the 24th of... Now, we're just going to pretend that Jesus was born on the 25th. We don't know that. You know, God did not you know, sit around at Costa one day on the 24th of December, year zero, and say, well, I'm a bit bored. What can I do today? Oh, I know. I'll send Jesus down to earth. And this has started from eternity past, truth be told. God knew what he was going to do. God knew what he was going to do. So I hope this Christmas time, this Advent, that we will be wrapped up in the mystery of all that God had planned and was going to do. And the good news is is that each one of you, if you're here as a believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ, you are in God's plan as well. Mm -hmm. What is your role? What is your role? Are you seeking after your role? 